Welcome, welcome. So let's do some physics here. This is part of my classical mechanics class. Uh, I have some videos using Lagrangian mechanics, uh, which is super awesome. So the idea of a Lagrangian mechanics is to take a system that's constrained in a particular way, and the uh, equation of motion can be determined from the Lagrangian L uh, that uh, satisfies the principle of least action. So if you calculate the action as the integral from t1 to t2 of L dt, it turns out that this function is such that this integral is minimized. So once you have a function to minimize an integral, the solution is the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is this. This says that if you take the partial of L with respect to one of the variables, Q, uh, you can have multiple variables, and this is what makes it so powerful. They don't have to be like legit variables. They can be whatever you want. Um, and that would be equal to the derivative of, with respect to time, the partial of the Lagrange with respect to the velocity, the variable of the velocity. Um, and, and this allows us to take a system like this. Okay, In this system, I have a half Atwood's machine, mass M2 on this frictionless surface, mass M1 hanging over, um, and I can describe this with just one variable. right? Because I only need one variable to describe the, the position of this, the configuration of this system. And that's great. It really is great for these kind of things. But what if I want to use that to find the tension in the string? So that's a force of constraint, right? That's a force that constrains the position of this to be relative to the position of that. So how do we do that? Well, this is where we use the idea of Lagrange multiplier. So if I first, number one step, is to pick the variables for the system. Now, this is a one degree of uh, freedom situation, right? It can either move one, one way. But I'm going to pick two degrees of freedom. So pick variables. Too many. I'm not going to show you how to use this. I'm not going to show you exactly where it comes from. So in this case, I want to under-constrain the system so that I can find the force of constraint. So I'm going to call this uh, position x, and I'm going to call this variable y. Okay, so I have two variables. Now, of course, in reality, Two, I'm going to have a constraint. There has to be some constraint between these two variables to make the string work. In this case, the string has to be a constant length. So that means that I could say x plus y has to be equal to some constant, right? If this is increasing, uh, this has to increase by essentially the same amount. Actually, x, the way I have it here, if x increases and y increases, uh, would it be x minus, let's see, if that one goes down a centimeter, that one goes over a centimeter, um, let's call it this. There. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> now x plus y is a constant. Okay. That's what's great about this. You can just change these things around if you get stuck. Now I'm going to write this as f of x, y equals x plus y minus c equals zero. That's my constraint equation right there. And you want it as equal to zero because it makes things easier. Now I have the following will be true. The following modified Lagrange equation looks like this. And I'm going to use my variables x and y. So I have the partial of L with respect to x plus lambda. And that's my uh, constraint variable. It's not necessarily the force. Partial of f with respect to x equals d dt partial of l with respect to x dot. And then I have the same thing for the y. So that would be the partial of l with respect to y plus lambda, same lambda, partial of f with respect to y equals d dt partial of l with respect to y dot. And then I can find the y constraint force. f y is going to be lambda partial of f with respect to y. The x constraint force is going to be at a lambda partial of f with respect to x. And so if I want to find these this constraint force, this is what I need to do. Let's get started. That's the plan here. Oh, I said pick the constraint, three Lagrange equations, four, apply, we're going to apply the constraint and solve for the stuff we don't know. 
and solve. I, I really didn't think this out. Solve. Okay, let's just get started. I'm going to start off by writing down the Lagrangian for this system. So I'm going to move this right here. And we can do this. This shouldn't be too hard uh, because these are Cartesian-like coordinates. So it's easy to write down the kinetic energy. So I'm going to say L equals the kinetic energy. So what's the kinetic energy of M2? Well, it's going to be 1 half M2 x dot squared. It doesn't matter which way it's moving because I only need the kinetic energy. What about mass 1? It's going to be 1 half m1 y dot squared. Now what about the potential? So here I'll call this y, uh, y equals 0. So this is the poten uh, zero potential. So m2 has no potential energy. m1 would be a negative potential. But I'm doing L is t minus u. So this is actually going to be plus m1 g y. So that's my Lagrangian. And then let's rewrite up here f of x and y equals x plus y minus c equals 0. Okay, let's start off with the x Lagrangian. So I'm going to say the partial of L with respect to x plus lambda partial of f with respect to x equals ddt partial of L with respect to x dot. Let's start right here. Partial of L with respect to x is equal to, there's no x in this term, 0. Now this one, the partial of f with respect to x is equal to 1. Because I have an x, and these are all just a partial, so I just have 1. So that's just lambda. Now I need the partial of L with respect to x dot. That's going to be, well here's an x dot, so I have a power rule. Bring the 2 down, I have 2 over 2 m2 x dot. So it's going to be m2 x dot, and there's no other x dots. Now I can put it all together. I need to take the derivative of this. Let's just do that, ddt, and that's just going to be m x dot, double dot. Okay, so let's put this all together. I have 0 plus lambda equals m2 x double dot. Now let's do the same thing for the y direction. The partial of L with respect to y plus lambda partial of f with respect to y equals ddt partial of l with respect to y dot. So let's start off partial of l with respect to y is going to be equal to no y, no y, here's one. So the partial of M G, m1gy with respect to y is just m1g. Next, the partial of f with respect to y. Up here, I have x plus y minus c, so I have a y to the 1 power, so I just get 1. Uh, now I need to do partial of L with respect to y dot. No y dot. Here's 1, so I get 2 times 1 half m1 y dot. And then I, there's no other y dots. Now I take the derivative with respect to time, and I get m1 y double dot. So let's put this together. So I have m1g plus lambda equals m1 y double dot. Okay, so let's just think what we have here. We have, I have 1, 2, 3 equations. So I have 3 equations and I have 3 things I don't really know. I don't know x double dot, I don't know y double dot, I don't know lambda. Up here, I'm going to solve this for um, let's see, should I solve it for uh, x double dot? So if I write this up here, x double, I mean, I'm sorry, x equals c minus y. So if I can, if I can take the derivative of that, x dot, it's going to be the derivative with respect to time of c is 0, so I get negative y dot. Now I can take the derivative of again, x double dot equals negative y double dot. Now up here, I can write this in terms of y dot, and then I'll have two equations, two unknowns, y double dot and lambda. So this equation becomes uh, lambda equals negative m2, that's a 2, y double dot. So y double dot is going to be equal to negative lambda over m2. Now I can put this into there. I get m1g plus lambda equals negative 
m1 over m2 lambda. Uh, so I'm going to add this to both sides and subtract that. I get lambda times 1 plus m1 over m2 equals negative m1g. Is that right? So if I add that to both sides, subtract that, I think that's right. Now I can divide both sides by this and I get lambda equals negative m1g over 1 plus m1 over m2. Uh, now finally I'm going to just simplify this. I'm going to multiply this term by m2 over m2 and get a common denominator and then I get lambda equals negative m1g over uh, m2 plus m1 all of that over m2. Then I can just get this, I can flip that and I get lambda is negative m1 m2 g over m1 plus m2. So what about the force in the y direction? F y, the force of constraint, is going to be equal to uh, the partial of f with respect to y, which is 1, times lambda. So it's just this. And I'm, I'm kind of concerned about the minus sign. I think it should be positive. Oh, no. Because I'm calling, I'm called y down. I called y this way, so the force of constraint would be in the opposite direction. That's right. Uh, let's just check and see if this is a reasonable value. Uh, so what if I take my system right here and I let uh, m2 be very, very, very large? In this case, the thing's not going to accelerate, and the tension in the in the string, which is the constraint force, is going to be the weight of m1. So if m2 is very large, then this on the bottom is m2. And then I get the M2's cancel, I get M1G. Okay. Uh, now, if M1 is very large, then the tension should be zero because it should be free fall. So this would be uh, if M1 is very large, I get the M1's cancel, and M2 is very small. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I think I think it's okay. Okay. Just really quickly, let's check this answer using uh, Newtonian mechanics. So here's my system. And I'm not saying this is a problem that is easier with Lagrangian, but it is a problem that we can do both ways, and that's nice. So if I use Newton's second law over here, I have uh, three forces. I have M2G, M M2G, I have the normal force, and I have the tension. And so these forces, since this doesn't accelerate up or down, n is equal to m2g, which I actually don't even care about. And so I can say f net in the x direction is going to be m2 times a, right, the acceleration of that, and that's going to be equal to t. Now if I look at the other mass, it looks like this. I have m2g and t, and I know that f net y is going to be um, m1 times the same acceleration, but this one's going to accelerate in the negative direction. So it's negative a. But these two values, a's, have to be the same. And that's going to be equal to t minus m1g. I want to solve for t, so uh, let's just go ahead and solve this one for a. So I get a equals t over m2. Plug that in down here, and I get negative m1 over m2 t equals t minus m1g. Um, I'll add this to the, let's see, add this to both sides. I'm getting a, I'm getting a different sign, but that's okay. So I get, I'm going to add this to both sides and add that to both sides. So I get m1g equals t plus m1 over m2t. So this is equal to t times, and I'm going to get a common denominator, m2 plus m1 over m2 and then I can solve for t. t equals m2 m1g over m1 plus m2. Same thing. So in this case which way is better? Um, well this way is cooler, right? I don't know if this way is better 
but uh, that's that's where we did it. So the key thing here is to under constrain the system and then apply the constraints so that we can find that force of constraint and that's how you use Lagrange multipliers. I'm going to do at least one more problem on this because I promised some people a long time ago that I would. Uh, I might do another one too, but we'll just see.